My name is Nadia Lala. I am the coordinator for health and information services at the Taubman Health Sciences Library at the University of Michigan. That means that I manage all of the print and electronic resources for the library and um, also manage all of the information services, which includes all of our reference services, access services, so things such as circulation, the instructional technology program, uh, building um, mobile apps, and something else that I don't remember at the moment. <laughs> The biggest difference has to do with the kind of material that the audience wants. So for example, uh, in working with undergraduates, they are still very much print focused. They like to get journals online, but they like their books to be in print. Now, that's something that is beginning to change, but for the large part, that's generally how they want to have their, their monographs is as print material. Health sciences, the focus is on getting the most current information, and that tends to be journal literature primarily. So almost all of the content we purchase that's journal-like is electronic. We have moved here at Taubman into purchasing primarily ebooks. Um, we made that decision about two years ago. But I would say about the bulk of, of the bulk of the purchasing that I buy, less than five percent is print. Everything else is electronic. I wouldn't actually say we don't care about books. I think that there is a difference between what the clinical staff uses, so clinicians, nurses. Um, therapists, pharmacists, and then what the researchers use. So the clinical staff is only interest, is primarily interested in current literature information. Um, that's journals. There is a subset of electronic books that they will use, and these are the standard textbooks, Harrison's Internal Medicine, um, Miller's Anesthesiology, that kind of stuff. The people who are engaged in public health, though, are still primarily monograph or print-based, and that has to do with the way that their field is set up. It is more social sciences related than it is science related, and in public health, there are fewer publishers who are engaged in electronic publishing. I could probably talk for hours about the ebook access. Oh, let's start with the first question. Are publishers and libraries getting it right? I think the answer to that is, yeah, kind of, maybe, no. <laughs> um, and I say that for a variety of reasons. As we've moved further into libraries acquiring and providing access to ebooks, publisher positions have tended to change. So when we first started the, this process out several years ago, there were some publishers that were absolutely adamant, never going to do an ebook. They were not going to get the revenue stream that they wanted to have by having a library have an ebook. What we've progressed to over the last five to seven years is something that's kind of in the middle. So publishers are willing to make their digital content available to libraries, but it comes with a lot of caveats. So Sometimes they want to rent us the content, so we pay money to subscribe. Um, leasing is the way to think about that. Um, we can spend, in our case in the health sciences, spend tens of thousands of dollars subscribing to content that at the end of the day we don't own. Um, and this will oftentimes be the only way that publishers will make certain items available. So for instance, if we look at products put out uh, by McGraw-Hill on their access platforms, a lot of the content that's available as an ebook, if you were to look on Amazon, you go, oh, I can buy this ebook. Yes, you as an individual can purchase that ebook. But me as a library, I don't get to buy the ebook. I get to rent the ebook. I get to rent the ebook every year for tens of thousands of dollars. And if McGraw Hill decides to not renew our contract or we decide we can no longer continue to afford to pay for McGraw Hill, we have nothing to show for the tens of thousands of dollars that we've paid. Some other publishers have gone the exact opposite direction, and they say, yep, you can buy the ebook and you can lend it to as many people as you want, but in the case of HarperCollins, yeah, you can only do it 26 times. So after the 27th time, you then need to purchase a new ebook. Then you've got publishers who have moved even further down the line from that and say, you can buy the ebook, you can lend it as many times as you want, you can have any number of users use the item at the same time. Uh, but And you can own the content, but you really only get to own the content in a digital format yourself if we go out of business. And then you have, at the very, very far end, uh, publishers who say, yep, 
we'll you can buy the content you can lease the content you can do whatever you want with the content and here are the records and we have a different problem of well now we have this information and it's on a cd but you don't have the infrastructure to be able to mount the cd in case that company ever goes out of business or you decide to not keep the platform you've got no way to take that material and then make it available to your public My goal for the ebook collection for the health sciences is to actually have available the greatest number of materials for the most number of people in the areas that they need. And that is not as simple as it sounds. Um, about 10, 12 years ago, the journal publishers moved to what were called a big deal package publishing, which you may have heard about in the collection management classes. And this was um, an example of Elsevier. They would take all of their journal content and make them available to libraries that they can choose to subscribe or purchase for a particular price. And oftentimes the price was, and it was incentive pricing in the sense that you would want, you know, these 10 or 12 really big important journals and you'd get a bunch of riffraff on the end, but the price was so good you went, yeah, okay, let's do that. Ebook publishers are doing the same kinds of things. I can buy or rent large collections of ebooks 15,000 in health sciences, 12,000 in social sciences, whatever it is I need to do, I get publishers, um, I get content that I really, really want, and then I get a whole bunch of stuff I could really care less about. Um, it makes it really hard in terms of trying to figure out what it is you want to buy. Ideally, libraries want to be able to cherry pick the titles that they want. So that you get this edition of Harrison's and you get that edition of Miller's Anesthesiology and you get a different edition of Bell's oral, maxilla or facial pain and you get to pick and choose the same way we currently pick and choose, most of the time, currently pick and choose our own print monographs. That's becoming a lot harder to do. The other problem we run into is that not every publisher has um, an ebook platform available. So they have ebooks, but they don't have a platform in which to put their ebooks, so then they make the decision to go with third party vendors. And the problem with third party vendors is that um, it's not always clear who has the rights to do what. So an example of this would be um, it's an older example, but it's an example where Gail Publishing uh, several years ago sold the University of Michigan an ebook. And when we went to look at the actual content of the ebook, we could see the text, but we couldn't see the images because Gail did not have the rights to the digital, digital images that went with the book. And in this particular case, it was absolutely crucial to have the images to the book. And it's those kinds of things that when you go to negotiate an ebook content, uh, an ebook contract, you have to ask, do we get all of the content? And by all of the content, I mean images, references at the end, and the text that it comes with. Uh, negotiating with vendors is probably the hardest part of my job. Um, it's always easier to negotiate when you get along with the sales rep, but it, sales reps in general have particularly difficult jobs, and it's very rare that we have the same sales rep for more than two years in a row. And since vendor negotiation is all about building relationships, it's hard to build a relationship when your sales rep keeps going away <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Um, some vendors are much easier to work with than other vendors. I would say um, that in the world of health sciences, perhaps the most difficult people to negotiate with are the larger publishers. So that would be Elsevier, Wiley, Ovid, um, McGraw-Hill. And that tends to be because they've been around the longest. They have the most content to offer. It's the content that we all want. So that puts them in a, a, in a power situation that gives them more leverage than it gives us. Um, and they know that we want it, and they, more importantly, they know that our staff and our faculty want it, so they are willing to charge whatever they want to charge, and we have to try and figure out, okay, how do we lower that amount, that price tag that they want. Some of the smaller vendors, <laughs> are, negotiating with them can be really interesting, uh, especially for the newer vendors, because they often don't understand the hot water that they've gotten into. So we have dealt with society publishers or organizational publishers where I've said things to them like, so can I get this as an IP-based resource, internet-based address resource, and the answer on the other end of the phone has been complete silence. What's that? 
um, asking for usage statistics, the fact that somebody might want to count how many times a particular resource is being used is also something that the smaller organizations can't quite seem to comprehend. Why would you want to count that? Why do you care why something is being used? I think I spend the hardest, uh, the longest amount of time negotiating contract language, and actually it's not the pricing as much as it is the content of the contract. Uh, at the University of Michigan, we try to negotiate all resources for all three of our campuses. Um, and it has to do with the way that we li like to be treated. Some publishers like this, some of them absolutely hate this. Um, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania are all large state-funded universities with lots of multiple branches. So when a publisher treats them as a single entity, the publisher oftentimes comes out on the losing end of that proposition because they don't make as much money. We only have two other campuses in addition to the Ann Arbor campus, so for us it's an, a real advantage to do that. Um, that's something we try to get included in all of our contracts and our licensing. Publishers will go back and forth with us about that. Vendors will agree to do something and a publisher will go, no, I just want it for one campus. Other kinds of problems we get with contract negotiations has to do with interlibrary loan. Can articles from the journals that we're purchasing be loaned to other institutions. Some people say yes. A lot of times they go, well, yes, but the way that you need to do it is you need to print a copy of the article and then send it to the borrowing institution. Um, sometimes they will let us immediately send the electronic article, but oftentimes that is not the case. That's something they tend to not um, want to negotiate with. Um, also, the definition of who is a user. Uh, we are a state-funded public institution, so we have an obligation to provide access to the general public, which is walk-in use. Lots of publishers do not like that kind of language in their contracts. They want to limit it to just people who are very strictly members of an institution, so staff, faculty, students. They don't want to give access to alumni. They don't want the general public walking in. Uh, SciFinder is a prime example of a resource where the general public is not allowed to come in and use a resource like that. That goes very much against our philosophy as a university library. Because we are state funded, because we are open to the public, we do feel a greater obligation to make sure that everything is available to everyone. But trying to get that kind of language into a contract can sometimes take as long as two years. One of the largest that we participate in is the CIC, which is the Committee on Inter no, Institutional Cooperation. There we go, CIC. Um, it's made up of a number of the Big Ten, now Big 12 universities, and a couple of other folks as well. Um, and on that behalf, when you put all of that money on a table, it's much more the level of negotiation, negotiation that happens occurs at a much higher level. It is 12 very disparate institutions that need to agree on the kind of information that they want to do. So for example, we are in the process of negotiating um, journal renewals for um, publishers such as Elsevier and Wiley, and these occur amongst the 12 universities that are part of the CIC. And as part of that, we're able to leverage our buying power, we're able to leverage um, things such as inflation costs, and we're able to get the greatest number of titles possible for everybody in the consortia to use. That's when it works really well to our advantage. Um, consortia can come in lots of different sizes. Um, the other consortia that we participate with is a very local one, and that's the Michigan Health Sciences Library Association Consortia. And that is a group that's made up of a couple of academic libraries, not a lot, but a couple of academic libraries and mostly hospital libraries. And the advantage here is not really for the academic institutions as much as it is for the hospital libraries. So for example, using STAT-REF, which is a health, sciences, um, a health sciences resource, we are able to purchase as a consortium access to, I believe it's 48 different titles on this platform that all of the libraries within the consortia can then subscribe to. The cost is easily 90% of what the cost would be if the library was to go to StatRef and say, I want the same 30 titles or 48 titles, and I want you to just give me a subscription just to those titles. Uh, the advantage of that for the hospital libraries, they have very small collection budgets. There is no way they can provide that kind of access 
for the amount of money that the satrap wants to charge on their own. But as part of a consortia, they certainly can participate and have access to all of those materials. Journal illustration leaves me speechless only because I want to say a lot of really bad things about it. Um, on average, on average, in the health sciences, our journals inflate by about 8% per year. That is very different from humanities and social sciences, where it's typically between 3 and 5%. However, we always have outliers. You've got to love these outliers. Um, in fact, I just got a bill today <laughs> for which the price has increased by 432% for a particular journal. Um, that's a lot for us to absorb. Uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure why publishers feel the need to charge so much for these kinds of journals, especially when a lot of the labor that goes into making a journal is actually provided free of charge as part of the scholarly communication process. They have free authors, people who write the papers, who've done the research. There's free peer review. The editorial board is generally free as well. The editor might get paid something, but up until now, there's not a whole lot of cost associated with it. The publisher does have to pay for the cost of digitizing the content, but again, most of the content is born digital in the first place. Nobody hand writes their manuscript and then sends it off to a publisher. We all put our stuff on Word and then send it to the publisher, and our images go to the publisher. It's all done electronically. So it's hard for me to understand why our journals are up around 8%. I think it's more a question of um, it's always been 8%, so we're going to keep it at 8%. That's, that's the way it seems to be going. It is really frustrating. Libraries are not bottomless pits. The Health Sciences Library is certainly uh, a prime example of that. When you have 8% inflation and then you have these outliers that come up around 432%, it's really hard to decide what you're going to keep. We are increasingly being asked to pay more money, and I'm not necessarily seeing that there's additional content coming for that. The title that is 432% is a title where they collapsed three journals into one and then decided to reduce the number of times that they were going to publish the journal. So I'm sorry, I don't understand why it is so expensive. Uh, and I'm having a very heated discussion with the publisher at the moment about that. When we get a new resource to evaluate, the very first thing that I look at is the price. Because if it is too expensive, it is not even worth it for me to go down the road of trying to determine whether or not this resource is worth our time or money. Um, and by time, I mean the time to evaluate it, the time to publicize it, the time to catalog it, the maintenance time that comes with keeping this resource up to date. And money in terms of, is this a one-time purchase that we are making, or is this something that I'm going to have to pay out every year? And then depending on who is making this resource available, is this a publisher who, going back to inflation, regularly gives me very big price increases from year to year, or are they pretty much static about what they choose, um, how they choose to increase their rates? Other things that I will look at um, after the price, and the price is a really big one, is the, um, the content that is being offered and whether or not it's unique. Uh, we are in the very fortunate position of being able to offer multiple resources. Uh, and a lot of unique content, but I get very frustrated with buying the same content over and over again. So if an aggregator database is the kind of thing I'm looking at, I will absolutely compare it to everything else that we already have. And this will sometimes be a very onerous title by title comparison of one database against another one. In some cases, this is thousands of titles that are being compared to see if in an ebook package, for example, you know, do we have any of the content that is being provided in this aggregated database? How much of the content do we already have electronically? How much of the content do we already have in print? How much of the content are we subscribing to electronically? Because while a price tag may look really good, oh, this database is only going to be $6,000. If I already own the content, why am I buying that again? Um, after looking at the content, the next big thing that I look at is the actual interface. Um, the good thing about clinicians is that they'll pretty much put up with anything to get the content that they want. That doesn't work necessarily well with students and for, and in some cases where we have people who have got uh, various learning disabilities or physical disabilities, 
interfaces can be a real issue for them. I also have to look at things like um, how does it look on a desktop? How does it look on an iPad or an Android tablet? How does it look on an iPhone or an Android phone? Those are things I didn't used to have to look at three or four years ago. I just looked at what does it look like on a desktop? Now those are all things that we need to consider. Um, and increasingly, whether or not something is available as a mobile app, whether something is available as a mobile website, how does it behave in a mobile device versus how does it behave on a laptop are all things I need to consider. So where a decision to, and I haven't even pushed it out to the librarians to ask them what they think about it yet. So a decision about whether or not I want to push a resource now will take me a couple of days because I have to do a lot of investigation before I can make a decision about whether or not, yes, this is something that we want to do or no, it's something we don't want to do. One thing I need to add about pricing um, that I did not mention before is that one of the biggest differences between pricing of resources for health sciences libraries versus all other kinds of libraries has to do with how the pricing is arrived at. Some publishers will price based on FTE or full-time equivalent and sometimes this is FTE students, how many full-time equivalent students are on campus in a particular program, our undergraduates, our graduate students are receiving scholarships, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes full-time equivalent FTE is how many FTE physicians or clinical staff or research fellows does a school have. Pricing can also be based on um, IP ranges. So we're a large institution with a lot of IP numbers. So uh, pricing will be based on the fact that we have multiple IP ranges, in which case we ask for a site license, versus having one or two username and password accesses. So one concurrent user, two concurrent user, that kind of thing. And finally, for, for health sciences, one of the biggest differences has to do with when the pricing is based on the number of bed sizes. So this has got more ramifications for hospitals than it does for academic health sciences libraries, but it will oftentimes be on the number of staffed beds, which is how many beds are nurses responsible for or and physicians responsible for versus number of licensed beds. And a licensed bed is actually how many beds are available in the entire hospital. So for example, a hospital could have 300 licensed beds, but are only staffing 200 beds. And for hospitals, paying the difference between a licensed bed and a staff base can be as much as 20 to 45 percent difference in their costs. I like, um, I like being able to look at that kind of stuff. I'm kind of nerdy. <laughs> I like the order of being able to look at things. I like to not duplicate our content, but I also really like to offer unique content. And it's been a great way to talk with vendors and publishers, especially if there's things that we don't like to say, hey, this is not working, or I don't like this content, or this interface is not what we wanted it to do, or why on earth did you put a particular link in a certain place? And most vendors are actually pretty responsive to what we have to say. So if we, uh, this is especially true if there's a brand new product that's coming out and we get to be a beta site or possibly an alpha site, it's a great way for us to influence how a, a future product will look like. And that has really shaped our decision about getting particular items because we've gone through the rougher beta process. We'll say, yep, yeah, you know, when the thing comes out in its final form, we are willing to get in on the ground floor and, and get this particular item. Most challenging part of my job as collection coordinator is trying to do everything. Uh, we work in, I'm very fortunate in that I have access to a technical services department that handles processing of electronic orders, processing of print orders, handles the cataloging, um, and then handles the maintenance requests. And the maintenance requests are things such as, this resource is not working today. <laughs> um, and sometimes that's because, oh, we forgot to pay the bill. Um, sometimes it's because, oh, there's a problem at the other end and we don't have access. Sometimes it is a, a question of um, IP, or I'm sorry, internet access not being available on campus. So the most challenging part of my job is trying to keep all of these plates spinning in the air at the same time. I'm never spending just one day 
buying stuff. I spend the day buying stuff and troubleshooting and cataloging stuff and evaluating stuff and talking to vendors and going, no, I don't want to pay this price and saying, yes, I really do like what it is we want to do and still have librarians and faculty and staff say, oh, would you buy for us? So it's a lot of different things. It is a full-time job by itself. <laughs> um, but many of us don't get to do this as a full-time position. And in fact, if you ever work in collections, you are going dis to discover that you will do collections on top of everything else that you're doing. <laughs> so just you know, be something for students to be aware of that the days when you just got to be just a collections librarian are long gone. So you will do this on top of everything else that you do. And this is very, very time consuming. The other big challenging part to my job is unlike with, uh, and I'm old enough that I worked when we just had print uh, print resources around, but um, unlike those good old days, electronic resources are so much harder to manage and there is not a good database management program out there, a software, um, anything like that that helps us pull all of that information together. So information on a particular resource for us at the University of Michigan um, exists in a couple of different places. It's in several different people's emails <laughs> in, that, in that wonderful Google archive. It's in our library management system, and we are using um, Aleph, which is developed by Ex Libris. It's in um, Footprints, which we use to do our ordering and cataloging and to track um, how we're progressing on those particular things. It's in a FileMaker Pro uh, relational database that we've built here at the Health Sciences Library, and uh, sometimes it's a pieces of paper that are it's stored in file cabinets. There is no way for us to have all of this together in one place. And one of the things we are struggling with at this minute is how do you corral all of that information into a single place so that if I want to know what's happening with geriatric syllabus review, I'm not looking in 14 different places to find the answer to that question. The bestest part of my job is I get to spend other people's money and I'm secretly a shopper and I love to go shopping with somebody else's money. Uh, it's a lot of fun to have a new resource um, and to take it out for a test drive and see what can it do. And I like the negotiating process. I came to this, I came to my position somewhat reluctantly as a collection coordinator. I didn't, I don't like to, I didn't like to negotiate. Although as a parent, I do discover you do a lot of negotiating. Um, and I've discovered that I, I really like negotiating with people. I uh, don't like the games as much, but I like the back and forth. I like being able to uh, disagree with someone on a particular phrase or a clause, um, but work with them at the same time so that we can come up with a result that everybody likes and everybody can live with. I like, um, it turns out I really like publishers and vendors too. Some of my um, closest working colleagues are actually people who are on the other side of the fence. <laughs> uh, my, my sales reps, the um, directors of sales in different places, directors of marketing. I have some very good friends in technical support who I've just talked to a long time over the years. So that part of it has been pleasantly surprising for me. I'm not sure what it looks like in five years. It's not going to be all online because there are too many disagreements with publishers about digital rights management. Um, and it's not all going to be about print collections being in remote storage because there are a group of researchers and students who are always going to need to use print resources. But I am really concerned that our abilities as a library, so as health sciences libraries, our abilities to be able to acquire information in a way that is inexpensive and to us um, and yet still freely accessible to students and faculty researchers is in jeopardy. And I think that's going to be one of the hardest things that we have to, to grapple with. Um, increasingly, there are, there are lots of publishers out there, but researchers and faculty and students tend to publish with the same four to five. If they really want to be out there and get tenure, it's Nature, it's Ovid, it's Walters Kluwer, it's Elsevier, it's Wiley, it's Oxford, and they have a real monopoly on that information. And we pay a lot of money to these five to ten publishers.
this is a fun thing to do. Um, you have to be willing to take change. If you are not somebody who likes change, do not be in the health sciences. Um, the best part of being a health sciences librarian is that we are literally on the cutting edge. And I didn't realize how much I liked that until I realized how much we were on the cutting edge. But I will say that I, there is a part of me that still very much longs for printed books. I, the one class I never took in library school was archives. And the one class I really wished I'd taken in library school as a collection development person is archives. And that is because um, everything is not electronic and everything is not about now. And I have a responsibility to think about the future historical research collection of the University of Michigan. That's really hard to do when you don't have the background in archives and you're not thinking about preservation and you don't have a good sense of what research could be like for future generations. 